Hello, everyone. Hey, let's get a little practice predicting SN2, SN1, E1, and E2 reactions. So that's the objective of this video. It's kind of a supplementary video. I'm just going to give some example problems and methods for solving, or more importantly, predicting which mechanism is operating. So then we can figure out what the products, or at least the major products, should be. OK. It begins by somehow consolidating all that information in the previous videos regarding these four types of reactions. So I call it a decision table. It's kind of a, a nice basis for kind of organizing your thoughts around those four factors, right? So the idea here is that there are four mechanisms, SN2, SN1, E2, and E1. And there are four factors that influence the rate of those four reactions. And the reaction that goes the fastest will determine the major products. OK, four factors then are key for predicting which mechanism is going to win the race and lead to the, to the major products. OK, four factors are first the alkyl halide. Is it primary, secondary, or tertiary? And this decision table kind of incorporates that. So on the right hand, sorry, this is my left hand. Left hand side over here, we have uh, primary, secondary, and tertiary. SN2, you recall, doesn't like crowding. So it works well with primary, but doesn't work well with tertiary. SN1's reverse. Not that it likes crowding, but more groups on the carbon will make it easier to make a carbocation. So tertiary halides are easier to make carbocations. Both SN1 and E1 require a carbocation intermediate. So tertiary alkyl halides can make carbocations faster, and um, they could be the, the reaction that runs the fastest and determine the major product. E2, not so much help. Remember the E2 mechanism is where a base grabs a hydrogen on the next carbon over from the halide. So in that case, um, it doesn't matter whether the halide is primary, secondary, or tertiary. The base is attacking the, the carbon next door. OK, so it doesn't really play a factor. That's the first factor, the degree or the classification of alkyl halide. Second one is the nuclear file or base. I like to pair up SN2 with E2 because they have, the similar, they have similar trends. E2 requires a strong base. But guess what? Good nucleophiles are also strong bases. Um, remember the saying that a good nucleophile, let's see, um, a good nucleophile is a strong base and SN2, where the S stands for sulfur and the N stands for nitrogen. So it turns out that thiols, sulfur, and amines, amines, <laughs> well, maybe not a tertiary amine. Um, we need to do substitution. So we need to substitute out these hydrogens for the, uh, for the you know, as it reacts. It's going to exchange these hydrogens. And the nitrogen or the sulfur has a lone pair that makes it a nucleophile, trades places, substitutes with the halide. OK, so SN2 and E2 both like strong bases because they're good nucleophiles, and E2 needs a strong base. S and one E2 kind of go hand in hand. They like making carbocations. Um, and you don't want oh, one of the other reactions, S and two or E2, to take place because they'll outcompete S and one E1. They will win the race. So if you have a strong base, E2, I'm sorry, E2 is going to win over S and one E2. If you have a good nucleophile and it's primary or secondary, S and two is going to win the race over S and one and E1. So really, you're looking at protic solvents that act as a nucleophile. So mainly, it's going to be the alcohols, an OH group on some carbons, and water. Um, they tend to be um, good SN1, E1 nucleophiles and bases. Water is a weak base. The alcohol is a weak base. Just because that lone pair. And then can accept an H plus. All righty. I think that's the general gist of the decision table. 
I'll use the decision table. Um, you don't get this <laughs> on the exam, right? Everything has to be tucked away in your head. You really just need a working knowledge of the decision table. So hey, let's take a look at some examples. So let's suppose um, on the exam, it says predict the products. Oh, and it might even say, and circle major products. And then maybe I got a list here we can go over. Um, let's start with this one. Cyclohexane ring. We got a chlorine here and there's a methyl next door. And the reagents is that. And I'll throw in a solvent, although we probably don't need one here. We actually saw sodium amide, NaNH2, in a previous reaction back in unit two on alkenes. So if you remember that reaction, it is that reaction. If you don't remember it, then look at your four factors. Think about the decision table. Let's see, how does that play out? Okay, four factors, alkyl halide, I like to do first. So what degree is this alkyl halide? It's secondary, darn it. Okay, if you take a glance at the decision table, secondary halides don't favor any of the four mechanisms. They all can work. Secondary can work on anything. So that's not so helpful. Okay, second idea is a nucleophile base. Um, well, there's two molecules here. So which one is the true reagent? The one with more charge, the more reactive compound. So usually anions and cations are more reactive than neutral compounds. That is true here. So Na for the periodic table is an alkali metal likes to be a positive charge when it's paired up with a non-metal, nitrogen. Metals and non-metals make ionic bonds. Yeah, the sodium is positive. Nitrogen is negative. And being negative, nitrogen prefers three bonds. But here, one of three bonds is an ionic bond. It has two lone pairs then. Ooh, and that's what we need for a base or a nucleophile is a lone pair. OK, um, ammonia has a lone pair on that nitrogen, but ammonia, NH3 is neutral. Na, sorry, Na, NH2, yeah. Soliumide is, is an anion, a much stronger base. It's a powerful base. Ooh, it's a base. So if you only look at this molecule, it's a strong base. How do you know it's strong? Because it kind of resembles in structure sodium hydroxide. It's got positive sodium, negative oxygen, positive sodium, negative nitrogen. And then nitrogen is less electronegative than oxygen. It's not dealing with that, po that negative charge very well. It makes it more reactive. If it had more electronegativity, it could stabilize that negative charge and be okay with it, like fluorine. Fluorine, sodium fluoride, is a weak base, even though fluorine is negative. As the most electronegative atom, that's a very somewhat stable base. It's a weak base. Nitrogen, though, not an electronegative, it's strong base. As a strong base, that's going to favor E2, but it also favors SN2 because strong bases are good nucleophiles. I should have put a little note here. If it's secondary, then any of the four mechanisms can operate. And now I've looked at two of the factors. The degree of the alkyl halide, secondary could be anything, secondary stinks. Looked at the nucleophile base, now the two molecules who found the one that's more reactive, NaNH2, and decided it's a strong base, making it useful for either E2 or SN2. Third group's a leaving group, but for the decision table, that doesn't help make a decision. Some leaving groups react faster, but they speed up all four mechanisms. And then finally, the fourth factor is the solvent. So if this NaNH2, sodium amide, is our base or nucleophile, then the other compound must be the solvent. Otherwise, why is it there? This is a solvent. As an aside, you might see that these have similar structures. It's actually very easy to make sodium amide in the lab. If you take liquid ammonia, you have to, um, ammonia is actually a gas at room temperature. So you have to chill this with dry ice 
Uh, so you get a beaker or a round bottle flask, put in some acetone and some dry ice. You don't use water because water will freeze with dry ice. You want it colder than zero degrees. So use some acetone with dry ice. It gets down to negative 78 degrees Celsius. So you blow in some ammonia, it'll liquefy. Um, you add a chunk of sodium metal and uh, make sure you have an excess of ammonia. So there's some solvent left over. And this does a redox reaction where you make sodium amide. And you'll see some fizzing as hydrogen gas is released. And I suppose I should balance this. <laughs> so organic chemists, we usually don't do that. Let's see, there's um, got three hydrogens over here and four over here. So we're gonna need more hydrogen. Let's add two, so we got six now. And oh, we need two of these, two nitrogens, two nitrogens. Cool, and we need two sodiums. Yeah, it's balance. Anyways, but the point was um, in the lab to do this reaction, go buy some of this reagent, go buy some solid sodium, keep away from water, um, add it to some liquid ammonia, and you'll have this mixture. You'll have leftover ammonia as your solvent. So then just add this alkyl halide and get a reaction to happen. Which reaction? Well, we narrowed it down to E2 or SN2. So what kind of solvent is going to help or hinder these reactions? You'll need to remember SN2 works best with an aprotic polar, aprotic solvent, which means the solvent Shouldn't, there's not, shouldn't be a dash there, sorry. Shouldn't hydrogen bond. So that means no um, OH bond in the solvent and no NH bond. Hey, this has an NH bond. Yeah, this can hydrogen bond. That's gonna slow down SN2. So the protic solvent, something that can hydrogen bond, slows SN2 and E2 wins. It's gonna win the race, E2 is gonna go faster. This is an E2 reaction. That was a lot of work. And we just got started. Now that we know the type of reaction, now we can predict the product. Okay, what does E2 do? Um, I need a little more room here. Let's do this. Slide over that way, good. Okay, E2, I like running through the mechanism. It's the best way to predict the products, but there are shortcuts. If you're careful with them, they can work too. Um, Na plus NH2 minus, it's an E2 reaction. Three arrows, one step. The lone pair is gonna grab an adjacent hydrogen, adjacent to the chlorine. So here's a carbon, so there's a hydrogen over here, there's another one over here. Great, so either one can be pulled off. We'll just write the mechanism for one of them. How about we grab this hydrogen? So NH2 becomes ammonia as it grabs a, a hydrogen. These bonding electrons become a double bond, a pi bond, and that helps the chlorine to leave as a leaving group. And we get a double bond on this side. The methyl group is still there. That's one product. And then we can also remove this hydrogen. And then we get a double bond between where the chlorine currently is and the carbon that ha has this hydrogen. So we're gonna get the double bond over here. So we predicted all the products. Think about cis and trans, because you're making alkenes and it turns out you can't have trans in a ring with seven or fewer carbons. So we got all the cis trans isomers. Lastly, you want to circle the major product. You're going to use Zaitsev's rule. This is one way to spell Zaitsev's rule. There are other ways. That's the alkene with most stuff, the most substituted alkene. It's going to be the major product. So nature says that if your double bond has a lot of groups on it, it makes it more stable. I like to circle it, but you gotta be careful. The question's saying, hey, please circle your answer. So I'm not gonna actually pin it in. But if you circle the double bond, you can see that as I circle it, I cut this bond and that bond as I circle the alkene. 
and I cut two bonds. So this is dye substituted. There's two groups on the alkene. Circle the other one, I'm cutting three bonds. This is tri substituted. More groups on the alkene makes it the major product. If you want a word for it, this is a tri-substituted alkene. More stable than a di-substituted alkene. Cool. One done. Let's have a look at another one. Let's see. I got another cyclohexane ring. Let's put a bromine here and an ethyl group. And we'll mix in this reagent. Pause the video, make your own prediction, run through the, the decision table, and we'll see how you do. All right, look at the alkyl halide first. That's what I like to do. Alkyl halide sitting on a tertiary carbon. Okay, so that's going to slow down the SN2. Um, it's going to help SN1 and E1, and E2 doesn't care about the degree. So really, this just says SN2 is probably not going to win the race. It's not going to predict the major product. Now look at the molecule with the lone pair and decide, is that a base or a nucleophile? Is it strong or is it weak? Well, this is neutral. And the pattern for nucleophiles is good nucleophiles are strong bases in SN2, sulfur nitrogen. Um, this is not a strong base. It is a weak nucleophile instead. That also makes it a weak base. The, um, the lone pair on the alcohol can accept an H plus. It's not very good at it, but it's still possible. It's a weak base. So this is favoring SN1 and E1. If it was a strong base, I would say it's favoring E2. It's not, it's not very strong. Let's see, leaving group is a third factor. Again, that's not helpful for decision making. Fourth group's a solvent. We're not given one. You could make the assumption that this is a solvent, though. Maybe this is used in excess. It's probably how the lab in the lab you would do it. You just mix, you know, weigh out, measure out the number of moles of this, add a huge excess of this. This is rubbing alcohol. It's pretty cheap. Let the reaction go. It's going to take a while because it's a weak base, the weak nucleophile, but that's what it's going to do. Um, I'm going to say this is also solvent. Can a hydrogen bond? And the answer is yes. It is a huh, protic. Gosh, I can't spell. <laughs> protic solvent. Again, no SN2. Um, actually, I guess this didn't help. SN1, E1 favor protic solvents, but so does E2. E2 actually likes protic solvent. The fact that it's weak, base and nucleophile, really eliminated the E2 as a possibility. Great. SN1 and E1 typically go on hand in hand. If you get one, you usually get the other. So we have a lot of products here. Okay, for SN1, we're going to make a carbocation. Thankfully, it's not going to rearrange. Right? And the first step. The alkyl halide pops off and makes a tertiary carbocation. Tertiary, so we're not going to expect the rearrangement. Good, because we're going to get enough products as it is. And then we substitute the lone pair, the atom with the lone pair. So where the halide was, now the oxygen is. Um, but remember HONC, Hunk? Honk the horn. H stands for halides and hydrogen. They prefer one bond. Oxygen likes two bonds. So that's not the product. Instead, this oxygen is making its normal bonds, two bonds, one to carbon, one to hydrogen. And it wants to substitute out one of these groups and add to oxygen this carbon. Well, who's a better leaving group, carbon or hydrogen? And probably leave as H plus or carbon plus, a carbocation. No, no, no. Um, H plus is a better leaving group. It's a better group to substitute out with. So oxygen keeps its carbons. 
And now you just put the isopropyl group, three carbons connected by the middle, wherever you want. No, maybe I'll put it this way. Seems to be room over here. And that's the product of the SN1 mechanism. It's an ether. Nice, we're done with that. The other thing that can happen is the reaction go by E1 mechanism, which starts by creating the carbocation, bromine leaves. And then wherever the carbocation is, that begins your double bond. So just copy the structure again. The uh, carbocation is here, so the double bond could go to the left. It could go, that was awful. It could go to the right. And it can go down. So the carbocation was here. It can also go down. And if you catch it before you draw it, you can realize that these two are actually the same molecules. Naming them will help convince you they, they, that they are the same. And if you catch that, you don't have to draw this. You're just writing the same molecule again. Cool. OK. Um, but I did, just to make sure. And it's not incorrect to put the same answer twice. Whatever. We want to circle the major products. OK. Zysos rule only applies to the alkene. So I don't care what you do with the SM1. If you want to circle it saying, yeah, this is going to be made, that's a good idea. That'll be one of the major products. Then among these, the alkenes use Zaitsov's rule. Which alkene has the most groups hanging off of it? Well, if you circle it, this has three groups. Circle this, this has three groups. They're all tri-substituted. You can circle all of them, or if you leave them all uncircled, I'll just assume you know that all of them constitute the major products. So all three of these, well, there's really two. These two are the same. Both alkene products are predicted to be made in equal amounts because they're both equally stable. That's S and one E1. What else we got? Um, let's try this one. I'm into cyclohexane today. <laughs> Nothing special about it. Let's change the halide. We saw bromine and chlorine, so let's throw an iodide. And let's treat it with some table salt and a funky molecule that looks like this. Okay, take a moment, make your prediction. Pause the video if you want to try drawing products, see how you do. Okay, I start with the alkyl halide and the decision table says that, hey, the halide is primary. So, it's probably not likely SM1 or E1. The exception, let's back up a step. Why is it not SM1, E1? Because primary carbocations are not stable. They're slow to be formed, to make. Nature's not going to do it. She's going to go by another route, SN2 or E2. The exception is if you have an benzylic halide. That is resin stabilized. So it is, well, that's secondary. So we actually have made a primary. Secondary um, carbocations are even, and that are resin stabilized, even more reactive than primary. But if we just have iodide here, this can do SN1 and E1 because it's a resin stabilized carbocation. You can also have allylic. So the words here are benzylic and allylic. The pi bond next door to the carbon, that's alkyl halide. The halide can leave and create a resin stabilized carbocation. Both of these can do SN1, even though they're both primary. So you have to be a little careful there. Here, there's no pi bonds. So we have just a plain old primary um, iodide, primary alkyl halide should not be doing SN1 or E1. SN2 or E2 should be faster. Okay, NaCl versus this molecule. Where are my lone pairs? There's one here, there's two here, two there, and there's four here. Okay, so one of those lone pairs is gonna, going to identify the nucleophile of the base. A couple ways to progress. Table salt, hopefully you know that that is not basic. <laughs> Doesn't change the pH. Okay. Well, maybe this is our base or our nucleophile then. 
No, this is actually DMF. That's good for SN2. It's one of the solvents we need to remember for SN2 reactions. Okay, so identifying that as DMF was really key here. It's a solvent, it is not a base, it's not a nucleophile. It's not gonna, these atoms will not show up in the product, but it's there to promote or encourage SN2 to happen. And actually that's our only choice. The E2 reaction is not gonna happen with sodium chloride. That's not a base. Um, yeah, it's all SN2. Okay, so SN2 is gonna substitute. So halide, you leave. And where the halide used to be, you add on our nucleophile and that's chlorine. Chlorine has a lone pair. It's gonna bump out the iodide. Nice, and one product. Oh, that's nice. You don't have to circle it. Only one product's listed. That must be the major product. If you want to circle it, you can do that. All right, another problem. Let's take the same molecule. Trio with different set of reagents. Pause the video and make your prediction. Okay, check the alkyl halide as primary again, and there's no resonance stabilized carbocation. So we're not going to make an SN1 or E1 reaction here. Which of these two is the nucleophile or base? Which one's a solvent? The charged one's more reactive. So that's potassium. Metal with a non-metal identifies an ionic bond. This is neutral, this is our solvent. What kind of solvent? Protic or aprotic? Protic. It can hydrogen bond. It's got an OH bond. Okay, so that's not going to be helpful for the SN2. It's going to slow it down, making another mechanism faster. And by process elimination, it's got to be E2. And it is. This turns out to be a strong base. We have oxygen with negative charge. Just like in hydroxide ion, oxygen has a negative charge, no resonance, not stabilized by resonance, so it's a strong base. Awesome, so the mechanism involves adjacent to the halide, removing this hydrogen and creating an alkene. The halide leaves and you get a double bond where the halide used to be. Remember when you remove the iodide, also erase or remove that bond. Technically, this bond becomes a new lone pair for iodide. It's gone. If you accidentally leave the line in there, you've increased the number of carbons. This molecule has eight carbons. It should still have eight carbons afterwards. It has nine carbons. So no, don't do that. I think that's all we got for that one. Cool, what else we got? Knocking these down. All right, let's deal with this one then. Okay, so pause the video, make your prediction. Where's the alkyl? Halide, dang it. That's the first thing that jumped out at me. And so what you have to remember is that this group right here is a tosylate. So go back in our video on SN2. There's a, a reaction you need to know that can create the tosylate from an alcohol. So this part, this oxygen right here, well, let's say it a little bit differently. This carbon used to have an OH group. And we changed the alcohol group into a tosylate. And now this behaves like an alkyl halide. 
So if it's helpful to you, you can redraw the molecule with your favorite halide, make the prediction, and it'll be correct for the tosylate. The key to remember is where the O is connected to the sulfur, that begins your tosylate group. So all these atoms turn out to be a really good leaving group. Um, my favorite halide is bromine. So where the tosylate was, if you redraw the molecule and substitute in bromine, now you can do this reaction if that's helpful to you. And the product for both of these will be the same. Okay, because that's what tosylates do. They react just like an alkyl halide and they actually react more quickly than bromine or iodide. It actually goes faster, but faster for all four mechanisms. Okay, so which mechanism operates? First check the, 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 um, the degree, what's the word? Um, classify the tosylate, classify the bromide. So the tosylate is connected to this carbon. What degree is this carbon? It's primary, just like this is a primary halide. Primary tosylates, ooh, that might do SN2, maybe. It can also do E2. It's probably not going to do, well, let's double check. There's some pi bonds, but next door to where the tosylate is, next door to where the halide is, there's no double bond here. So this is not allylic, it's not benzylic, no. So now I'm confident saying, no, we should probably not be getting E1 or SN1. We're not gonna make a carbocation because it's primary and it's not resin stabilized. SN2 looks pretty good or E2 because E2 doesn't care what degree it is. So now look at this compound. Ooh, same hydroxide, strong base. Yay, so, S, um, so it should be E2, right? Maybe. What kind of nucleophile do you need for SN2? Well, good nucleophiles are strong bases. Okay, so hydroxide ion could be either a strong base or a good nucleophile. We need a solvent to break the tie. And darn it, no solvent was given. So if, we had perhaps water as a solvent. That's a protic solvent. That would say, okay, we definitely get E2. And if we chose your favorite aprotic solvent, maybe it's DMF, maybe it's DMSO, maybe it's acetone or acetonitrile, that would have said we got SN2. We didn't get anything. It's both. So on the exam, if you can't decide between the two, like I can't, I don't have a solvent information, we have to assume both can operate. So again, you could say tosylate counts as a halide. So do the SN2 reaction on this one. So where the halide is, put in the lone pair, it's gonna be the oxygen. That's an awful benzene ring, sorry. <laughs> And then the sodium is vector ion, it, the oxygen is going to keep the hydrogen. The product is an alcohol. Same thing up here. The product is an alcohol. Oops, and there's a methyl group on this side. I forgot about that. I was too concerned about my nasty looking benzene ring. E2, what do you do? Um, where the halide is or the tosylate begins your double bond and it has to go to this carbon. And that's it. That's the only alkene product from the E2 reaction. So if you want to circle both of these, you can. You can leave them both blank. I'll understand, yeah, those are both the major products. Nice. Okay. Um, what else we got? Let's try, ooh, let's try that one. Pause your video if you want to make a prediction. Begin with the alkyl halide, that's secondary. That didn't help, it could be anything. Which of these is going to be the stronger base or nucleophile? The one that has charge, ooh, NaOH, 
looks just like this molecule in 7H, it's an ethyl group. Yeah, this is a strong base, suggesting E2, but strong bases are good nucleophiles, suggesting SN2. We do have a solid. There's another molecule, and there's an OH group. That's protic, which suggests no SN2. So the winner is E2. Yay, E2. OK. E2 reaction is going to take place, which means where the halide is begins your double bond. Remove this bond. The chlorine carbon bond is gone in the product. So I just kind of copy and paste over the molecule. I like putting a little dot where the halide used to be, because that's where the double bond is going to begin. That's the skeleton. The double bond could extend to the left or go to the right. Check for cis and trans. Oh yeah, there's a hydrogen pointing up here, another hydrogen pointing down here. So if we move the methyl group, we can draw the cis isomer. This one's cis, that was the trans. The identical groups were the hydrogen on the alkene. Hydrogen, hydrogen, if you like to draw them in, you can. Now the hydrogen's on the same side, cis. Sounds like two S's, same side. Yeah, these two H's are below the double bond. How about this one? Um, there's a methyl up here and a methyl up there. If you switch those two, trying to switch the methyl and the hydrogen and make the other isomer, yeah, switching two methyls, identical groups. Um, this has neither a cis nor a trans isomer. All right, circle the major product. Well, this double bond has three groups on it. This one is trans, only has two groups. This one's cis, only two groups. This one wins. Nice. Cool. Let's um let's go to another page over here. Let's try this one. Pause your video. It's getting a little tricky. Okay, so what degree is this? What's the alkyl halide? It's primary, but it's also benzylic, meaning that this carbon's right next door to a pi bond. That means it's okay for SN1 and E1. And primary, it's good for SN2. And E2 doesn't care. So darn it, this molecule based on its structure can do any of the four mechanisms really well. That didn't help. Okay, look at this compound. Um, that's either a nucleophile or base. Where's the lone pair? It's on the oxygen. K is potassium, right? Alkali metal with oxygen non-metal. This is ionic bonding. Oxygen negative, potassium is positive. This sort of looks like Potassium hydroxide, a strong base. It is. That's a strong base. Also, these four carbons, the tert butyl group, this molecule is actually potassium tert butoxide. If you want the name for it, it's a very common strong base. It's bulky. That slows down SN2 because this compound actually carries some crowdedness with it. So I'm thinking based on this, yeah, it's a strong base, which also makes it a good nucleophile, but crowded, it's bulky. So based on this reagent, I'm thinking it's probably an E2. Okay, so what's the pattern? Um, halide leave. I'm going to put in parentheses here because this is actually not the right answer. Why is this not the right answer? Well, the pattern is wherever the halide is, that begins the double bond. Double bond should go there. Whoa, carbon. You have five bonds. This cannot be SN. I'm sorry. This cannot be E2. You can't put a double bond there, even though the reagents and the Everything's predicting E2. 
Okay, so you have to be careful with the decision table. You know, don't violate, you know, nature's rules here. You can't make five bonds. Um, you could also look at the mechanism, right? The mechanism of E2 is that the lone pair is going to grab the adjacent hydrogen. Wait, is there a hydrogen here? No, there's no hydrogen. So this molecule cannot act as a base. Adjacent to the halide, there is no hydrogen. Can't get that E2 reaction to go. Instead, what are we left with? Well, this is still a strong base, good nucleophile, even though it has some bulk. And the SN2 is being slowed down, but it's a good nucleophile. That's gonna be better than these, which require weak bases, weak nucleophiles. It's still a strong base. No, it's not gonna do SN1 or E1. It's going to be SN2 instead. The main idea here is negative oxygen makes a strong base, which makes it a good nucleophile, either E2 or SN2, but it can't do E2, leaving SN2 instead. So if you want, you can take the shortcut on the benzene ring, use a circle inside a hexagon, same molecule, and where the chlorine used to be, Put on the lone pair of the oxygen and oxygen, you keep your carbons. So there's a terbutyl group there. Nice. Oops, let's go up. There's more room up here. Okay, let's um, do one last one. Let's look at this one. And knowing it's the last one, it's going to be a little more challenging. Of course. <laughs> That's a wedge bond, by the way. OK, pause your video, make a prediction. Sorry, you paused it and now you're waiting for me to start talking again. I'm easily distracted. <laughs> so look at the alkyl halide. What degree is it? It's secondary. Darn it. Could be any of the four mechanisms. Find the base or the nucleophile over here. Identify the one with charge. So lithium is an alkali metal. Paired up with a non-metal, it should be ionically bonding. It is. Oxygen's negative. No resonance. Makes it a strong base, just like lithium hydroxide is a strong base. That's going to favor E2, but strong bases are also good nucleophiles. So it's also SN2. So solvent, you going to help me out? You betcha. Um, that, that's a protic solvent. This can do hydrogen bonding. So sorry, SN2, you'll be too slow. Oh, and why are these paired up with similar structures? Same idea, if you take methanol, the name of that alcohol, put in a little lithium metal, make sure you have excess solvent, then you can form the base. Oh, I wrote it backwards. This is actually more typical of uh, the general chemistry. We usually list the cation first, then the anion. The organic chemist says, nope, carbon's first. And anyways, be used to either drawing it either way. It's the same molecule, right? And then you're also going to form some hydrogen gas. So we're going to need more. Is it two and two again? I think it is. If it's balanced. I think we're balanced. Yay, we're balanced. Uh, anyways, sorry, I'm easily distracted. I think I already said that. That's why these have similar structures, because it's easy to prepare the reagent yeah, as long as you have some lithium metal around. Methanol is pretty cheap. Toxic, though. Be careful with that. Um, we decided it's not SN2, it must be E2. Cool. Okay, so the pattern is remove the halide, begin your double bond, either to the left or to the right. But before we do that, one more thing. So back in our video about E2, E2 had two interesting effects that the other three mechanisms did not. One was the deuterium isotope effect. Because of the mechanism,
where you have some base, strong base, the mechanism is lone pair picks off the H plus, the bonding electrons for that hydrogen form the pi bond that kicks out the, the halide all in one step. If you put a deuterium atom here, that deuterium atom connected to the carbon is a little stronger than a hydrogen. It's twice the mass of this, you know, it's inertia, it's twice as much. Um, quantum mechanically, that bond's a little stronger too than a normal CH bond. Because it's a stronger bond, heavier atom, it's a slower reaction. So you can actually get the deuterium isotope effect slowing down E2 reactions if this is a deuterium, you know, an isotope of hydrogen with a neutron in it. That's one thing to remember. I don't see the letter D anywhere, so it doesn't even apply here. But for E2 reactions, keep deuterium isotope in, in mind in case deuterium shows up. What else do we know about E2? This mechanism requires that all four of these atoms are aligned. The word for that is periplanar geometry. They have to all be lined up. And in our video, I said most of the time, your alkyl halide can spin about the carbon carbon bond and get these hydrogens and halides, all four atoms lined up, unless you're in a ring. And the only ring I said I would worry about is cyclohexane. So now the question is, here's the bromine. E2 wants to have that go away and remove the adjacent hydrogen. So one of these H's or, one, or this hydrogen needs to be removed. So potentially a double bond this way and that way. The periplanar geometry might prohibit one of these hydrogens from leaving if it's not in the same plane. It may not work. The bottom line is both the hydrogen and the halide must be axial for periplanar geometry. In order, if you have a ring, cyclohexane ring rather, the only bonds that can be periplanar can be aligned in the same plane. Oh, sorry. Uh, must be axial for um, the E2 reaction. Sorry, I really messed myself up there. Um, so in a ring, cyclohexane ring, you have to check and see if it's possible to have the halide and the adjacent hydrogen to both be axial. Okay, so that means to answer this question correctly, for full credit, we need to draw the chair confirmation. Okay, so you get to decide how you want to wiggle it. I'm going to draw both of them. <clears throat> so go back to um, unit one, long time ago, and kind of refresh your memory on how to draw the chair confirmations. There is a shortcut. I'll point that out in a second. Here's the shortcut. You don't have to draw both chairs. Pick one. And then the only way E2 works is if you put the hydrogen in the halide periplanar. I'm sorry, put make them axial so that they're periplanar. So um, when you're drawing it, you decide how you want to draw it. I want the bromine axial. So do I want to put it up on a peak? I personally, you can, you can. Um, personally, I don't want to because I imagine myself being above the ring and looking down. And right here, I am above the ring looking down. The bromine is going away from me. So as I look at this ring, this is the top view of the, of the cyclohexane ring. This is the side view of cyclohexane. So if you're up here looking down, the bromine should be away from you. It should be down. So maybe I'm gonna put the bromine here on an axial bond where it's supposed to be. So that's this carbon and this carbon. And then you have to maintain the same orientation, same reference here. Um, if I go counterclockwise, starting on bromine, the next atom is the isopropyl group, these three carbons. And it's on a wedge bond, or in other words, Wedge dash means trans. Bromine and isopropyl have to be opposite. The isopropyl group is here. On the other axial bond, up on a peak, the equatorial bond is parallel to another bond, this one and this one. That's where the hydrogen is. 
darn it, the hydrogen is not axial when bromine is axial. That means this hydrogen cannot do an E2 reaction. No reaction here because it's equatorial. Look at the other carbon. So if we go over here, this carbon clockwise, this carbon clockwise, it actually has two hydrogens. I maybe I should use dash and wedge because all the other bonds are dash wedge. But what's kind of cool is the adjacent carbon on this side has two H's. One of them is axial. So E2 is happy because now the base, which is this one, CH3O minus, can grab this hydrogen, put the double bond here, and kick out the halide. Oh, this carbon, so going clockwise, is going to be the methyl group pointing down. So the methyl group is going to be on the downward axial bond. You know what? I am just going to exploit the shortcut. Um, uh, the long way is draw the chair flip. So all your axial bonds have to be equatorial. All the equatorial bonds have to be axial. But the key point here, yeah, the hydrogen adjacent to the halide and the halide, they both have to be axial. So you can do periplanar geometry, which is required for E2. All right, we, predict, we use the mechanism, predict the product. It can only go here. It can't, the double bond cannot go there because this hydrogen can't get axial when the bromine is axial. So between these two carbons is your double bond. So let's redraw the molecule, leave out the halide. So got this group here. Nice purple group and over here is the methyl. And where the, that's the, sorry, this one's where the bromine was. Jason hydrogen's over here, so now the new double bond's there. It's the only product. It must be the major one, so you can circle if you want, or you can just leave it. Oh no, yeah, only one product. That is the major product. Whew. That's plenty for now. I'll see you in the next video.